partly cloudy and 27 degrees in downtown Toronto. Canadians from coast to coast to coast will head to the polls in this country's 42nd The campaign will be election. 11 weeks long. Canadians go to the polls October 19th. Canadians will make a serious choice between proven real world experience On a Sunday morning deep in the languid days of summer, when Canadians are least likely to engage in politics or even notice the news, Stephen Harper launched the longest election campaign in modern Canadian history. The longer the campaign, the more money it costs. And Harper knows his party has more money than the others. No wonder nearly two in three Canadians say the only thing politicians want from them is their vote. Is politics broken? You betcha it is. People don't even come out to vote anymore. The politicians really need to stop, say a lot less, and listen a lot more. Is politics broken? Instead of focusing on which politician is going to win or lose, we should be focusing on the issues. People are cynical about it. Participation rates are very low. So, of course it's broken. When people don't have faith in a system that is designed to give them power, something's not working. Dave Meslin's despairing analysis disguises the fact he's actually a sunny optimist. He believes there are plenty of us, ready, willing and able, to embrace a more active political life, but our political culture discourages it. And he sees an unintended metaphor in the asymmetry of Toronto's City Hall Towers. Inadvertently, it was designed in a way where you got these two towers and all the windows are just facing each other. So you've got hundreds of bureaucrats only looking at each other, not looking out of the city. But sadly, I think that's how people actually view politics right now. That no one's listening to us. They don't know where their entry point is to insert themselves into the process. Yeah, it's like they're... Some of the most obvious problems also have obvious solutions. What private sector business, for instance, would ever talk to its customers like this? This is allegedly a public notice that the government puts in newspapers to let us know what's happening. No one's ever going to read this, and if they did, they wouldn't understand it. Yeah. So when companies advertise to us, they use a lot of color and vibrancy because they really want to get our attention. Yeah. So imagine if like Nike, for example, wanted to advertise and they did it the same way. This is like if, if, if City Hall were running Nike, this is what a right. sale would look like. Yeah, it would look like this. And of course, you've never seen an ad like this in your life, and you never will. Yeah. What we really would see from a city that cared about our opinion would be something like this. That's okay. a public notice that has a before and after picture. It says, have your say, come to the meeting, visit us, call us. It's, it's, it's giving you all the information clearly it and wants actively to be read. encouraging you to participate. It, it wants, wants to, to be, be read. read. Yeah. yeah. Meslin's no casual observer of day-to-day -day politics. He's currently traveling Canada and the US in search of a hundred remedies for a broken democracy. Acknowledging that politics is broken is not a declaration of defeat or failure. He was part of CBC's debate, Is Politics Broken?, earlier this year. And he argued for the yes side. That is, yes, it's broken all right. Into something positive. Meslin's disenchantment with the status quo was not the end of his thinking about it. We brought him back to the CBC atrium to get a better sense of why he's still a glass half full guy. Everyone wants the world to be better than it is. For some reason, a small handful of us actually actively participate in that process every day. And what I've been trying to figure out through my work is, why is that? Why is it that most people don't act on their instincts, um, that the world could be better? And if we can figure out why they're not participating and then change the environment around them to make it more conducive to engagement, I think we could have a really different kind of politics and democracy where people, we can transform people's cynicism into action. And that would be better for everyone. This is what engagement looks like. The players are in control, but in the stands are thousands of people who believe they have a stake in the outcome. They understand the issues, are well informed about the options, offer advice and feedback to the players, and hold their team, its manager and owners, accountable for results. I'd like to reach a point where it's just as normal for 40,000 people to fill a stadium for a political event as we do every week for a baseball game and try and figure out how to take some of those elements and add them to politics. Not to the point where you're dumbing it down and making it just a show, but I, th I think there's things we could learn.
it's, it's a mix and match. We have Maslin's to appeal for a hundred remedies to fix democracy you know, has so far you know, uncovered some pretty simple fixes. More civics in school, weekend election dates, voting reform, as in get rid of our first past the post system that allows candidates to be elected even when most people vote against them. And CBC is projecting that the next government of Alberta, Canada's most conservative province, will be a new Democrat government. My friends, the NDP. My name is Rachel Notley, and I want to thank you for electing me as your premier. Democracy can be resurrected from the dead. We saw just such a miracle in Alberta this year. We came to Calgary to see whether the stunning change in government meant that democracy was really on the rebound here. Was there something happening that maybe began with the election of the city's wildly popular youngest celebrity mayor, Nahid Nenshi? Apparently not. Is politics broken? I think so. I think uh, some of the major political pa parties have lost touch with uh, decision makers like me. I believe we should have a system based on proportional representation where votes are distributed more accurately across the country. Something that I think that politics could use more of is transparency. I think that if the public knew more then they would feel more empowered and feel like they could make better decisions. Stephen Carter was the engineer behind Nahid Nenshi's explosive entrance into Calgary politics and national recognition. And he was the key to Alison Redford's surprising capture of the Premier's office. Totally did it from outside. Yeah. I brought in a totally different group of voters. So he knows a thing or two about what makes the 21st century voter tick. Yet he does not have lightning in a bottle, nor does he share Dave Meslin's views about earnest voters and their keen desire to engage in the process. On the contrary. Let me foundationally start with, if you had a better electorate, I mean, this brings the Winston Churchill quote. Right? I mean, the best argument against democracy is five minutes with the average voter. I mean, I'm going to get nothing but trouble for that. But it is so true. So, you know, in the case of Alberta and the Notley election, there are a lot of th reasons why people might think that's a very encouraging time, sign. That the province has taken back control of its politics, that it has real competition in politics, that it's got rid of a potentate. And you're saying that's not true? I'm saying that the per there was a choice made. A choice was made to go in a new direction, but it could have just as easily been the Wild Rose as it was the New Democrats. Of course, the NDP supporters are saying this is a validation of our policies, except if you were to ask a voter why they voted for the NDP on that particular day, if we had old style exit polling, you would find, and I did my informal one, people weren't voting for the NDP, they were voting against the progressive conservatives. And that's so fundamentally different. Do you mind if I point out <laughs> that you know, I came into this conversation thinking that the guy who was behind Nenshi and, and Alison Redford and, and seems to be supportive of progressive change in Alberta is nevertheless a bit cynical about how that happens. Oh, I'm tremendously cynical. I am the most of the cynical. People always said that Nenshi was the smartest candidate and he had these great big ideas. And then you'd say, well, okay, great. How many people do you think read the big ideas? How many people do you think read beyond the, tw the, the six word headline? Right? It was less than 2% of the population that visited the website. So we had 130,000 people visit the website. Of those, 2% actually went and read the policies, stayed on the policy page for longer than five seconds. Five seconds. Right. And I mean, we still got 144,000 votes. So there were even people who'd never understood what his issues were, who voted for him, who thought he was the smartest candidate. That became the mob. The mob said he's the smartest candidate with absolutely no evidence that they themselves had. They took other people's word for it. They took the, the general direction from the rest of the mob. It's almost like you're saying we need a better electorate. Well, absolutely. We can go and we could ask somebody about health care policy or what drives health care policy, why we're making the decisions that we're making, but all we have is perverse incentive, right? No one wants a health care system that keeps you well. They all want a health care system that keeps you from dying. I'm watching a guy eat a pogo over there, bacon on a stick, right? I mean, he's, you know, <laughs> dude, you're not helping the health care system. But that's, you know, he doesn't want us to stop him from eating a pogo. He loves pogos, right? Bacon on a stick's what he wants. And then when he gets sick, he wants the health care system to step in and help him. No, we should have stopped you from eating the pogo. They, they don't care.
And so if you don't care, then you get exactly what you deserve. We are getting the governments that we deserve. I think we've actually developed a really cynical view of the masses. And I think that's really um, sad because I think we actually, as individuals and collectively, have so much potential, which shows that it almost doesn't matter who's in power. Whoever's in power will always respond to public opinion. And there's kind of goalposts on any issue of where the politicians can flip back and forth. And they're often pretty narrow. Change doesn't happen when the politicians move within the goalposts. Change happens when people shift the goalposts and create space for politicians to move more to the left, more to the right, more up, more down, more wherever. Public opinion controls politics. We still, as, as a society, control politics. It is a democracy. Politics is happening around us all the time, and people do shape it. What brought these people out was anger with the Toronto police practice of carding. Carding gives police power to stop anyone, anytime, for questioning and then to keep a record of the encounter on a file card. Police seem to be carding an unusual number of black people, including Desmond Cole, many times. I didn't want to get handcuffed or arrested or something. I didn't want to be uncooperative, so I just decided I have to, and I gave my license over to him. He went to his car for several minutes. He came back, gave me my license, and then said, okay, you're good to go. Have a nice day, as if nothing had happened. Cole told of his experience in a Toronto Life cover story that reverberated across the city. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much. Nothing else so effectively knocked the mayor out of his political comfort zone. It is my intention to see that carding is cancelled permanently and that we start fresh. Any story that comes to mind that you can share with us? My conversation with Desmond Cole, you know, I'd read his article and I sat down with him for an hour and a half or longer and, and just listened to him talk about his lived experience. The fact he's been able to push against a policy he feels threatened him says something about the health of our politics. Or does it? And I try to remain optimistic that we can fight for change and we can do so successfully in partnership with people in political office. My worry and my hesitation with that though is that we have to acknowledge that sometimes they just don't want to do what we're asking and if you want an example of that after my story came out and Mayor John Tory was put under extreme pressure to do something he did come forward and he said I'm going to end police carding he then voted not to end police carding and to have some interim measures so the system is ever resistant as it was to actually listening to people's concerns and making change, particularly on this issue of policing, because it's a very sensitive issue for people. Race, policing, bias, you know, unjust stops, unjust profiling. People don't want to talk about this, man. Do you think that you have made uh, a difference, that this will lead to a change, or are you still waiting to see because we're not at the end of the story yet? I think politics can still respond. It still has the capacity. Our system is not beyond help or repair. And I know actually a lot of people will probably disagree on me, with me on that, but I couldn't actually put myself out the way that I do if I didn't have some hope. I have lots of hope. When people suggest that politics is broken, what that means for me is that politics is only good at responding to some people. When you go into debt to get an education and then you can't find work, when you feel that you're discriminated against in your community, but there's no recourse. That's a person who's gonna say, the system is broken, the system's not working for me. So I think we should think about who politics might be serving and who it might be leaving behind, rather than just saying it completely works or it's completely broken. Three of the candidates for prime minister were in Ontario today, doing all they could to steal votes from one another. As Conservatives, we conservatives. believe that there is no higher calling than raising. I believe the in cooperative, collaborative leadership, and that means working what with the What we're proposing is to put more money into selling Canada as a tourist destination. From our bird's eye view of the political culture, we saw clearly that our politics could work better for us. What else? Well, that our politicians and our governments could do more to engage with us, for sure. But what else? Well, maybe that the fault is not entirely with them, but with us too. 
we're all responsible for the state of our politics and how to improve it. Keith Bogue, CBC News, Toronto.